The word that comes to mind when characterizing today's guest, Christian James Hand, is passionate. Christian is half of the duo that wrote the theme track to this podcast, but that's just an unbelievably tiny blip on the radar when considering Christian's body of work. He's effectively held every title imaginable within the music industry, and as the host of the sessions, Christian has certainly struck his stride. Now as a member of none other than John Mayer's management company, the session's reach is growing further and further, and I'm here to tell you, if you care at all about music and you haven't had the good fortune of tuning in, then you're truly missing out. For the last several years, Christian orchestrated the sessions as a traveling show amongst four different major cities where it breaks down some of music's most famous songs in front of a 200-person audience. Clearly, during the times of COVID-19, this came to a screeching halt, so Christian took it to the Instagram airwaves. I thoroughly enjoyed this conversation, even as we ventured away from several of the roads I'd planned to go down. Christian has spent time living in England, Libya, Botswana, Long Island, New York, and Los Angeles. He describes what it's like navigating the world with Asperger's, as well as shares how he started doing canyon drives in McLaren's with Matt Farah. There's a lot to unpack here, and I think you'll enjoy it. I can't stress enough, if you're not tuning in to the sessions live on Instagram every weekday at 11 a.m. Pacific, you're missing out on something very unique, special, and musically inspiring. I'm your host, Wesley Smith, and you're listening to the Standard Age Podcast. Christian, thanks so much again for taking the time. Um, a coffee mug, downtown Truckee. Have you spent time in Tahoe? This is my uh, this is my favorite place in Truckee. Nice, man. Coffee and every time I go there, I buy a, a cup because, you know, it's good to have a little coffee cup and they're fucking awesome. Yeah, I um, so I live right down the street from Dark Horse and then there's Dark Horse in Truckee as well, which I think is I think that was their second location. Anyway, I could go down a coffee rabbit hole, of course, but um, but but wanted to get into this a little bit different than normal. Um, you're a drummer and a musician, obviously, um, producer you've had like every credit I feel like or title in the music industry. <laughs> um, I've worn a lot. I've worn yeah. A lot of hats. I have a question that I'm interested to hear your response. And that is who is the drummer that is the most avant-garde style for their respective genre? Like who, in other words, like who plays in a way that you would otherwise say this doesn't belong here but does so incredibly successfully. Um, Thomas Pridgen, who plays with or played with, I don't know if he's still with them, uh, played with the uh, the band that At The Drive-In became after they were At The Drive-In. Okay. Whose name I, I forget uh, briefly. Uh, somebody can, somebody's frantically yelling it at, the, at their phone. Uh, that guy is a, a monster. I mean, that band is 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 crazy. Mm-hmm. At the drive-in, we're, we're nuts. Damn it, I can't believe I'm forgetting there. It is early in the morning. Um, but yeah, good. Thomas Thomas Prigian plays in a way that shouldn't really shouldn't really fit. And then the guy that played for him afterwards in the same band is even more maniacal. I will remember it suddenly at, at some point and yell it out. But if you want to see, once I remember it, there's an amazing... Um, performance of them on on letterman um that what that you just get to watch a band that actually it shouldn't really work at all but it's maniacal and brilliant uh so i would say i would say he's probably the most shocking i think ginger baker played in a way with cream that didn't really make a lot of sense um as far as you know inside the music uh and he's also a madman so ginger baker's style was pretty crazy um, I'm sure there are others that I'm not aware of, but those are the two, the first two that I would think of to answer that question. Yeah, cool. Um, you were born in one of the raddest named cities ever, Stoke on Trent. Yes. What? T- tell me about that. I mean, you lived there till when? Well, I, I Stoke on Trent is is the uh, is more the geographical area. I was born in a tiny village called Tittensore, which is sort of a uh, and out in the out in the English countryside, which is very hard to beat as far as beautiful countrysides are concerned. I, agree. Uh, I was there, and then we lived there for the briefest of times. I think we were there for something like six months, and then we took off to Libya, and then we came back when Gaddafi moved in. 
and then we went back to Africa for about five years and then we went back to London and we stayed in uh, London until 1983 and then I came to the United States of America to Long Island. Uh, the joke that my parents said was that we had promised ourselves we would never live in another third world country and failed. <laughs> um, because Long Island in the 1980s was a bit of a cultural wasteland to be honest with you. Um, but I loved it. Uh, and then I went to college right outside of Manhattan at SUNY Purchase and then stayed there until 97. And then I came to California and this has been the longest six month visit of my life. I didn't think <laughs> I was going to stay here for longer than a year. That's for sure. Right. Right. So what did mom and dad do for a living that created those moves? My mom was a, uh, a hairstylist, is now a kitchen and bathroom designer, but at that point she was a hairstylist. And my dad worked for the, uh, the, so it was called the post office at the time, but the post office in England before it got blown to pieces, handled everything, phones, telecommunications, computer systems. So my dad was an engineer and uh, we basically went to Botswana to, um, for a United, it was a United Nations program, I believe, um, where uh, Sir Soretsi Kama, who was the president of Botswana at that time, uh, was very forward thinking and wanted to develop his country for it to become, you know, significant on the world stage and to be able to operate in this, the, you know, he'd gone to school in Oxford. So it was basically a program to raise the infrastructure and build the infrastructure of Botswana. And my mom was the stylist to the president and his family, which was pretty oh, no cool. No kidding. Wow, that's um, awesome. <clears throat> out of, I don't know how that happened. And then it was, you know, like I look at the pictures and it's, you know, no shit. It's like 22-year-old, 23-year-old kids, all hippies, all long hair. And their job is to build this country and uh, did a, an amazing job by all accounts. But that was, my, my parents have, my dad specifically is a is a, a gentleman who likes to travel and likes to see the world and likes to experience new things and then you know uh, when you have a family you drag those poor fucks all over the world doing it to them as well yeah 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 well it creates certainly a well-rounded view of the world i think i think there's no education quite like travel yeah i've traveled and certainly like living in places to have done you know pretty substantial tranches of my life in different cities and then you know one of the things that is really beautiful about England is, you know, back before these morons voted for Brexit, the ability to travel in and out of Europe, you know, like class trips weren't to Philadelphia, class trips were to Paris. Right. Class class trips were, you know, deep into other cultures and other countries. And certainly, you know, in the in the seventies and early eighties, the cultural homogeneity hadn't really is that a word? Homogenization, whatever it is that hadn't really kicked in. Like you wouldn't walk through fucking Paris and find a 7-Eleven. Right, right. Much more, you know, no Starbucks. It was the cultures, and especially in Europe, when you can travel an hour and almost go through two countries, um, you know, you got to really see different cultures. Uh, it's a little more, as I said, like a little more homogenous now, but obviously they still, different languages, different money. But Europe is beautiful because the proximity and then the ability to just travel through it. You can, you know, in one afternoon, you can travel through s six countries. Yeah, it's like traveling through the northeast of the U.S., you know, those, the, the, all those states are so close together. When, uh, when did you start playing music and what was your first instrument? Um, when I was in high school in England, which is actually six years long. Um, so when I went in to high school, I decided that uh, I wanted to take up, we had to take up an instrument. So I wanted to play the saxophone. And uh, I went to my dad and I said, listen, you know, like the problem with playing sax is that you have to buy a saxophone. They don't provide it. And my dad looked at me and was like, I'll list to you the fucking 600 fucking things you've wanted to do that you then quit a week in, I'm not buying you a fucking saxophone, find an instrument they had there. And I looked at him and I was like, oh, okay, I'll find an instrument they had there. And they had drums. So I picked drums to half piss off my dad and B, the other half was because I, I had fallen in love with Phil Collins at that point. Mm. And uh, I started a lifelong resentment of the drums at that point. <laughs> Fair enough. I would load my drum set into my house, like on college breaks and shit like that. And my dad would look at me and say, are you sure you don't want to take out the saxophone? <laughs> oh, that's brilliant. What did you study in college? 
I went originally to be a a lighting designer for theater, and then I switched to be a set designer, and then uh, decided that I didn't like the program at my school, which was one of, it was the best program in the country at the time. Uh, I didn't like the fact that you know that you gave up your entire life for this thing. I didn't go to college to have a job. I went to college to have an experience, so I left. And then when I went back, I just got an English lit degree because I felt that, you know, I love, I love reading and I love writing. And I don't think that having a functioning knowledge in, you know, one of the most ubiquitous languages in the, in the world sort of gives you a bit of a Swiss army knife to be able to do a bunch of different shit. Um, and it also gave me much more time to be involved in the radio station, to play in bands, to have a job, to be able to, you know, really have a well-rounded college experience and I loved it. I read, you know, some really amazing books. I, I focused on uh, contemporary European authors at the time. Um, and it was, uh, you know, I had a teacher who was, he did a, a class on Emerson where we would barely handle a sentence a week. Like I remember we did like five days on why a comma was in the middle of a sentence. It was right. like, just it was total like the dissection. World, just absolute fuck. Or it was Whitman. It was either one of those two, but it was amazing. So getting to do that was much more enriching. And what's really funny is that when I moved to LA, a bunch of my school was a real, as I said, was a really, really well-respected school. So there was a network of people that had graduated and gone into the industry. And when I moved to California, to Hollywood, there was a bunch of them here. So I ended up working with a bunch of them and making exactly the same amount of money without having made my life fucking miserable at college. And I would look at them and just be like, it was smarter. <laughs> Me or you? And they're like, well, I'm smarter because I'm the director. I'm like, yeah, no, that's great, but we're getting paid the same amount of money. So it seems to me that you're not as smart as you thought you were, kid. But that was the original goal was to become a uh, to go into theater. Oh, okay, cool. Well, um, so were you working at the radio station in college then? Is that your foray into radio? Uh, I was. When I was a kid in England, there were two. Uh, I loved radio. Like radio is my. Um, my number one passion legitimately. And there's not, not many people say that. Um, so when I was in England, there were two DJs. Um, there was a DJ by the name of Kenny Everett uh, and another guy by the name of Noel Edmonds. And these were sort of my radio heroes. And I wanted to, my parents told, reminded me, I, I didn't remember, but when I was really young, I would hide behind the couch and give them the weather for the day. <laughs> Just to be the the you know the, the removed voice just talking into the air. Uh, so when I came to you know I always wanted to be a DJ on the radio. It was you know England had national radio, so I was a little bit bamboozled um, when I came to America and it was private. It was a different mm. it was a different world. But when I came to when I went to college, I saw the, the college radio station and I was like, oh maybe you know I can go do that. So I did that for three years, and when I left, I honestly thought that like my radio career career in quotes, I was like that was it. Sure. And then just very strangely, um, which I you know sort of uh, aligns with my philosophy on life. I sort of found myself dragged to a series of. You know, there's a great meme going around, like people think success is a straight line, but this is actually what success looks like. Right, right. <laughs> you know, so I sort of like went off on a bunch of really weird side tangents and then ended up becoming a DJ on a, uh, a, a, a commercial radio station in New York. And then they were the ones that transferred me out to L.A. So I didn't really I didn't follow a career in radio, a, a career in radio sort of hunted me down, to be honest with you. Well, you were on some pretty um, incredible tours and whatnot. What is your single most standout memory from traveling with PM Dawn? Oh, man, Prince B. Um, the, there were two, the two things like being, he knew that I, so it's a long story, but you can find it on my, my Man vs. Radio podcast. I tell the whole thing. But I'd had a crush on Sinead, and when I first met, Prince B, I said, I want two things out of you. I want to ride in a helicopter and I want to meet Sinead O'Connor. And then we ended up going, <laughs> we ended up, we ended up going on tour with Sinead and she and I had this like really beautiful, innocent, like on the road, not really romance, but like this really beautiful friendship for a few, a couple months. Um, so that was great. But my, I think my favorite was we were in Paris and we went out to dinner one night and we were in this tiny little like subterranean as many of those little French restaurants are like down underneath the street. 
and we went into one and and uh the it was barely anybody there and there was sort of a, like a pickup band playing at a couple of tables and what the waiter came over and he said the owner wants to meet you and the owner came over and was like are you pm dawn and he was like yeah and he's like oh, i'm a massive fan he's like would you play and the whole band wasn't there but there was enough of us and I had been the, you know, drum teching and basically stage managing that tour. And our drummer wasn't with us. And Prince B, who I was, had become really close friends with uh, and remained after the tour, uh, he was like, yo, Christian, fucking do the drums. So I sat in and we did like an impromptu 20 minute PM Dawn set at some tiny little restaurant under the ground in, in Paris. And it was just a really, it was something he'd never done before. And it was really beautiful to watch you know, somebody that you love have a, a, an experience and music performance in that way and getting to share in that was really, really special. Wow. So that was probably my, beside the Sinead thing, it's probably my favorite of all of the, but there were so many, I mean, just like ridiculous. When you're on the road with somebody for a couple of years and, you know, you have a, an affinity for each other, the, 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 the craziness is, I mean, we did this, there was another one. This was really cool too. So we, we spent a lot of time in LA because we did the, the grad nights, which is when they open the Disney parks to just the graduating seniors. And then they have a bunch of bands playing. So we did the one in LA. And I remember we stayed here for like two months at the Mondrian and, and the chronic was being released. And we all went in Prince B's rented SUV and we went to the fucking warehouse on um, La Cienega and we bought the record. And then we walked across because the parking is at the Beverly Center. And we put the CD in thinking we were going to pull out and drive away. And instead, we all just, it was like me, him, his bodyguards, and his cousin. And we sat in this car and listened to the chronic start to finish. And like knew that hip hop had just changed forever. And it wow. was really cool to be sitting in a, in, you know, sitting in a, in a, in a car with people that were involved in making that and were, you know, as a hip hop fan to be able to experience that with, with, with those guys. And just to sit there, it's like, you know, the first time you hear Smells Like Teen Spirit or whatever other, right. you know, moment you want to attach, you know, musical significant moment you want to attach a memory to. It was a really cool way to experience that record because it was also a bunch of New Yorkers being like, fuck, Los Angeles just fucking took the crown, man. Like, we have to fight this shit. This is something we have. And we have like, you know, like that West Coast hip hop thing. We had nothing in common. Yeah, I was going to say is also a local artist, too. It was, yeah, and it was like a local sound and like bringing yeah. that G, the G funk thing in quotes was something we had no fucking, you know, the the Moog, like him ripping, or not ripping off, but him sort of like taking all of the, the P funk stuff with the Moog synths and the leads and all that. And, and then, of course, Snoop Dogg fucking shows up and we're all just like, ah, we're fucked. <laughs> so, so begins the battle. You know what I'm saying? It was like the first shot fired. So That's that was hilarious. a really cool experience. Oh, man, that's cool. You know, I, I'll probably, uh, I'll probably edit this out, but rank. Nothing compares to you. Prince's version, Sinead O'Connor's version, and Chris Cornell's. Oh, Sinead's. Number one. Number one. I mean, the thing. You're the, biased. Uh, I'm biased, but I also <laughs> think that the. What's interesting about it is that, neither of the other two, tell the story of that song the way that she does because. Mm. The part that's really important in the in the Sinead version is the relationship between her and her mother. I see. Which doesn't really exist in the other two versions. And especially if you know the complications of her being raised Catholic and all of the fucking horrors of her family, there's just this, you know, like you watch the video and if you've never seen the video, uh, you should. When she starts to cry in the video, it's actually like a real moment that happened during the filming. It wasn't a staged thing. And neither Prince, like Chris is gorgeous, obviously, but Chris's version to me is less of an ownership of the song and more an homage. And mm. Prince's is an ownership, but it's not an ownership in the that gorgeous, like the thing with the Sinead version is it's one of those songs that sounds like what it's about, which right. doesn't happen very often. Like Walking on the Moon is another perfect example, um, you know, where the song itself sounds like what the lyric is about and the, the that Sinead O'Connor song has an ache in it that none of the others have and I think a female perspective on that is or well, the female inhabiting that song is why it works so so well I mean so many people didn't even know it was a, a, a Prince cover that's how well she did it 
Right, right, exactly. I think generationally, if like if you're my age, I'm 40. So I, the first time I ever heard it was Sinead's version. Right. So, um, yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Um, what are the qualities that get you promoted from nighttime DJ to the afternoon drive slot? Um, what do they look for? Uh, with, so that was interesting because the, the program director at that station was both my nemesis and my uh, greatest fan, which is a really great combination and I think is a very rare combination. It sounds like corporate America. <laughs> it, it does. It's just often, you know, like the relationship is much more adversarial than encouraging. And it's really, it's really rare to find yourself in a situation where the person who's leading you into a new career is both the biggest cock you've ever met and also really, really good at what they do and teaches you a lot. And we had such a, it was such a dynamic dynamic, if I may. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing, he had a very specific way of doing radio. And the thing that I gave him was I took his bullshit rules that I hated and I made them work for me. And I became really, really good at doing his specific kind of radio. Mm. And that was why I got moved. And it was a really, it was a very rapid move. I mean, it was like three months, which is, and he was very flattering about me in the press and, and still says that I'm the, you know, I'm in quotes, the most talented air, air the most talented person he's ever put on the air, which is a, a great thing to be, have said about you. It's just, I wish that a cock like that hadn't said it about me. Um, but we still, <laughs> When I, he was at Sirius as well, and uh, I used to go to Sirius, and everyone there. So he left my radio station in Cali and went straight to Sirius. So everyone in Sirius saw Steve as like this fucking, you know, Darth Vader character. And I would just walk in and not give a fuck because this dude and I had been on like the shittiest little backwater radio station ever, which was beautiful. But, you know, I'd walk in and then I'd just sit in his office and there would be 15 minutes of silence. And then he would just look at me and be like, you're going to sit there all fucking day, aren't you? And I was like, I'm going to sit here until you say hi to me, Steve. And he'd be like, what's up, man? And then we'd have these conversations that were just like, stilted and weird. But he, uh, the reason I got, <laughs> the, the path was accelerated was I had never had another program director. And he gave me really, you know, I have Asperger's. So he gave me really strict confines to work in. But the trade-off for that was that he allowed me to put programming on the air that nobody else was doing. So I was willing to play his bullshit game, and he knew that the reward was all I wanted to do was put, put music on the air that was different and trying to break as many rules and break ground with all of the things that I did, you know, uh, which was awesome because that was, that, was what, that was a trade I was more than willing to make. I'll talk for yeah. 20 seconds at a time. If you let me, you know, there was a point where there was only three people in commercial radio in America that were playing electronica. It was called techno back then, but electronica mix shows. And it was me, Liquid Todd, and Jason Bentley. And that's in the entire country. And so, you know, the explosion of electronica into the mainstream, I was part responsible for that. So were you playing bands like Prodigy and things like that, or like what? Were yeah, you we had we were doing all the Prodigy stuff, Crystal Method, but it was much deeper yeah. than that. And it was an actual mix show. Like the thing that we did that the other that Jason didn't do, but Liquid Todd did, was we had guest DJs come in, like Friction and Spice, and because my friend in Porchester ran a, a, cool, a night on Fridays called Bounce, which was like the local underground techno party rave it would have been called um and that started at 11 and the radio station we came off at 12 so those people he booked who were groundbreaking djs would come and do our show and then go down and do his show and it was unheard of and we had a big air studio so 30 of my friends would all show up and we would basically just have an hour-long party playing groundbreaking music in a format that hadn't been done and wasn't being done on radio anywhere else. Swedish Eagle was also at that point. I, I have to say that Swedish Eagle was underground doing his thing out here. But that was the trade-off. He was yeah. like, I'll fucking grind you down to a nub. I will make you fucking do radio exactly the way I want you to do it. And in trade for it, you can do this stuff. And I was like, dude, I'll make that fucking trade. 
It's funny, you know, like you're saying that most people looked at him as Darth Vader, and I'm like just envisioning you viewing him as Helmet from Spaceballs. <laughs> like, <laughs> yeah, it was totally dark Helmet. It was yeah. totally dark Helmet. I was just um, like this fucking guy. That's crazy, man. Um, God, that just sent me in like three different directions, everything you just said. Um, how long have you known that you had Asperger's? Um, I, it was... I think I was, uh, it was two, I was working at Soundbreak, which was a, an internet destination, uh, entertainment portal. That was like this groundbreaking site that we blew like $90 million in a year. It was just web 1.0 where the spending was just ridiculous. And they get, they gave the keys to a bunch of morons and we were just like, yes. I mean, we had a fucking blimp. That's how fucking far we went with this oh craziness. God. We literally had a blimp. So uh, that's not an exaggeration. Um, so I was, you know, I was in the, I was in tech as well as entertainment. So I was like, fuck it. I'm going to, you know, I'm going to get a subscription to Wired Magazine because at that point it was the Bible of tech, you know? Um, so I got a subscription to Wired and I was reading an article about the explosion that they'd seen of autism in Seattle and San Francisco. And they were trying to work out why that had happened. And what they sort of sussed was that, computers because they are binary you know zeros and ones and if you feed the thing the correct information the correct thing will happen that was something that autistic people that's how we function in life so there was this huge explosion of really powerful i mean you know bill gates is clearly on the spectrum if you know what the criteria are he fits all of them um you know one of them is a high male voice and his voice is up here when you hear him talk. He has like no, there's no base to his voice whatsoever. So I was reading through this article and they were saying that, you know, autistic people were, had moved to these cities because they could code and do really well inside the, the computer world. And then they were meeting, socializing for the first time because usually autistic people were sent to fucking homes or just derided and had tough, you know, had a weird time, went to college and was socially awkward. Well, now you got a bunch of fucking autistic people hanging out getting paid enormous salaries meeting each other falling in love and having children and those children have the have a dominant gene it's two you know the chances of two people with autism having a non-autistic child are not high hmm. so i was reading this whole article and i was like oh, this is fascinating and then on the sidebar there was this gray sidebar where they were talking about this dude hans asperger who had discovered asperger's in the 70s and early 80s because he had been researching autistic kids and then he looked at this group and he was like, there's actually a group of kids inside autism who aren't autistic, but they're not neurotypicals in quotes, which is a fucking term I hate, but right, right. You know, that's how they Venn diagram that thing. So he looked at them and realized that there was, it was a spectrum and there was a very high functioning part of this spectrum. And those children were going to be struggling, but they were going to be struggling almost in silence because, you know, he has a great quote. It's like, if you want a kid with uh, Asperger's to be normal, just put them in a room on their own. Right. Because once you don't have anything to bounce off of, you're completely normal. You're just on cruise control. Yeah. You're just a normal psyche. It's when you have to, you know, experience the world that the Asperger's. So as I was reading this thing, I started to cry because it was, it was, describing every single experience that I had ever had in my life. And I was 35 years old and I went to see some specialists and one of them was a really, really great guy in the Valley. And I have no idea how I ended up at his place. And he was looking at me and he was like, listen, you're 35 years old. We can't test you because you'll out Asperger's the test. Cause you know what all the fucking <laughs> answers are. He's like, so you'll, you'll get a hundred percent. He's like, so basically, you know, what you have to deal with is that an undiagnosed Asperger's person, at 35 years old is basically just a trauma patient because mm -hmm. you've just been traumatized your whole life because things don't work the way you think they should. People don't work the way they think you think they should, how you want them to. The world makes no sense. It's a total chaotic environment. And I remember calling my mom and she was, you know, not very understanding the first time we spoke about it. And then she called me in tears and she'd been listening to a woman on NPR who had written a book called Joshua's Cup, which is about raising a kid with autism, not necessarily Asperger's, but she had heard her own experience through this woman. And then through talking to her, we really drilled down to the fact that clearly my grandfather had it clearly one of my uncles had it you know it is a it is a dominant thing on the female side in males 
Mm. But I think that that has more to do with the fact that Asperger's in females is, is different than Asperger's in males. So I think they're now starting to really work out what female Asperger's looks like. Yeah, that's interesting you say that because the only people I've ever come across, met, talked to that with Asperger's, they've all been men. Right. So the diagnosis for women is really, it's kind much more nuanced. Yeah. So I think they're now starting to really work out what female Asperger's looks like. So it does, I, I think that the definition will change, but up until that point, it was mostly seen in males on the, f- male children on the female side of the family. And Got it was it. pretty obvious that my gra- my grandfather and I are almost exactly the same person. Gotcha. So my mom is like, oh yeah, no, probably your grandfather had this as well. Right, right. So let's talk about your radio show, the IG live sessions, for example. Those things are completely, I mean, they're prolific. Um, the show really breaks, well, why don't you describe the show actually? It's called The Sessions on Air, right? Uh, yeah, it's just called the session. I had to call it the session on air because some fucking Scandinavian band had the session, unfortunately. Oh, for Instagram. Yeah. So, uh, and also for our, the email address. So I, uh, through, you know, through being in the studios in LA in the, you know, mid nineties, no, sorry, the mid two thousands, you'd walk in and sit down with an engineer and the door would shut and he would look at you and be like, all right, dude, I got like two Fleetwood Macs and a Stevie Wonder. What do you got? And you'd be like, okay, I got three Who's and a Marvin Gaye. And you would trade it. And what you were trading with these actual master recordings of the, you know, the original sessions of these world renowned famous songs. And the reason that they were out was because the tapes, you know, they were recorded on tape. And every year they have to take those tapes and put them into these ovens and rebake them because the glue starts to break up the layers of the tape. Right. And they start to fucking come apart. So you have to rebake them. And gradually over time, you know, you get to 30, 40 years and those tapes are actually now disintegrating. Mm -hmm. So what the record labels would do is they would send the tapes to studios. The studios would just run the tape into pro tools and then have a digital version of the masters of these recordings well the fucking record industry is renowned for having fucking pirates all over the place so if you're an engineer who's been sent the masters to stevie wonder and nobody's looking at you there's no armed guard in the fucking studio you just put that shit on a hard drive and then you give it to all of your friends right so there was so so you know there was a a lot of queen stuff so i you know i i through working in a lot of studios and knowing a lot of people, I'd accumulated this pretty sizable library, which is now at the point that it's, I mean, I look at it daily and am amazed at what I possess. Um, so I started doing a show on Sirius with a, a, a started being a guest on a show on Sirius where I would just do vocals. And then I left Sirius and I started doing whole songs. And then the, you know, the idea came to try and do a live version of it. And what I do is I, you know, it's a show where I, I, I can play you, the bass, drums, guitars, and vocals of these amazing performances by these unbelievable artists explain the song to you, show you how it works, but do it in a way that isn't music nerdy because I'm not a music nerd. I don't know anything about composition or what if I can find D on a fucking keyboard, that's it. Um, So it's really sort of like a layman's way of looking into the songs, but also telling you the players and the studios and really trying to get people to understand that these songs don't just magically come out of the ether. They come right. out of the ether for the creators, but the actual getting them to come out of the speakers <clears throat> is a is a story unto itself. You know, yeah. each one is a each each song is a book. Not even like each album is a book. Each song is a book. Yeah, for sure. You know, to be able to tell those stories. And I was doing a live show in four cities before COVID and then was really starting to go out of my mind. My radio station, I wasn't comfortable going there because of COVID, so mm-hmm. I wasn't even doing a radio show. So I found basically that there was a cable that I could buy that would plug into the back of my mixer that I could plug into my phone, and then everything changed for me at that point. And I've done 290 songs in COVID. Yeah, it's incredible. In seven months. I um. I'm oh, sorry, I because I, I attended the one. I think it was you were filming that day. It was Jackson Five's ABC and Elton John. Yeah, the, uh, Saturday night, Saturday, Saturday, Saturday night fighting. Yeah, that was an incredible session. You go on for what a couple hours, right? It's an hour a song with a 20 minute intermission. Right, right. 
and you, you know, like you get to hear these things in a way that you've never experienced them. And in a room like that, where you get a big PA, where you can fucking hear these things at like, you know, live show levels, it's just outrageous. Nobody gets to listen to music at that, at that volume, you know? Well, and two, I like the dichotomy thing that you do too, where like, they're genre centric, completely unrelated, right? Like, yes. well, I mean, I, I like that sort of dichotomy because it, and do, do you choose that on purpose? Yeah, what I did was I, so that was, that was kind of early in the system. And I, and I started to, because I realized that I had to, I had to make it comfortable for people to come. So there always has to be a headliner that people are going to. The reason I did both of those is because I knew I was filming. But usually my choice is that the opening act, as I call it, the first song, is something that I know people either don't give a fuck about, don't know anything about, or have an opinion that's pretty strong. And then I'll headline it with something I know everybody's going to enjoy. So one of my favorites was I did Pantera and Queen. Because I knew that these fucking scumbags would all show up for fucking Queen. But if I had done a Pantera song, I'd have 10 people in the room. Right, so right. I did a Pantera song. Like I filled the room with 200 people who came to see Queen. And I made them learn why Pantera are amazing. I, you know, like that, that to me is, that's the most exciting part. Like I love revealing to people. And, you know, my thing is like, I don't expect you to leave a Pantera fan. But what I do expect you to leave with is an, a knowledge and a respect as to why Pantera are Pantera. I don't expect you to go home and be like, dude, fucking vulgar display of power. Yeah. I mean, you should, you <laughs> should listen to vulgar display of power in its entirety because it's unfucking believable. But I just want the next time some asshole says, oh, fuck Pantera, man. But you're just like, nah, I don't think you really know about Pantera. It's funny. I had that album, but I also owned Cowboys from Hell, which I don't know. Was that more poppy? Could I even go there? Yeah, no. So, so what happened was Cowboys from Hell comes out and then, uh, Metallica releases the Black Album, right? And Pantera were like, "That's the softest fucking bullshit ever. We're <laughs> gonna make the hardest record ever made." And then they made Volga Display of Power. Yeah. And there's actually been a remaster they did about ten years ago of Volga Display of Power, which is available on Spotify, and it is heavier than the original pressing. Oh wow! I'll oh, do the remaster of that thing. I thought they had reperformed it because the fucking thing sounds so different. So different yeah. It's unbel it is the most brutal record made, I believe. Oh, I'm going to look that up right after this. So good. Yeah, the re the remat is that it was like the 20th anniversary re-release of Volga Display. They re-released all of them cuz they came out like almost a year apart. Um, but Volga Display to me is like Pantera at its most brutal Pantera. Yeah. Um so this might be a stupid question, but I just don't know the answer. So is there any plan to save the sessions for later viewing through Instagram? Uh, I have. I mean, I know it's live, right? So if you save it, then it kind of doesn't become live anymore. That's why I thought it was kind of a stupid question. But I was just thinking that like. No, I mean, the reason I didn't save them was because the copyright bot can find you easier uh, if, if they're archived. Got and it. also, I, I really like the idea of being present yeah because everything is on demand everything you can binge watch everything is at your behest and i just thought that there was something really special with the idea of if you weren't there you missed that version of it you know like when i did prince and fucking wendy from you know wendy and lisa of the, of, of the revolution were in the chat room talking to us or yesterday where out of nowhere nile rogers fucking shows up for a fucking you know diana ross show you know those moments are so much more special because they can't be re-experienced and i think that 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 value is it's in today because that's how it used to be you'd sit there with your fucking tape deck and, and play record and try to grab these gossamer moments off of the radio and if you didn't they were gone and i think that that gossamer nature makes it it makes it much more special for me. And it, I think it, I would hope that it makes it much more special for the viewers. And, you know, I do have 130 of them, I think have been archived. And at some point I will, uh, I'm thinking of like doing a limit cause I can't sell them because I don't want to make money off of them in that way. So I'm thinking of doing like a limited run of like 300, two terabyte hard drives that have all of them on there. 
Oh, cool. And then, and then you donate. You know, my fear is honestly that I've said a lot of really stupid things and I don't want that shit to come back and bite me in the ass. Oh, uh, well, I, I don't think you have anything to worry about. Um, but I love, I love that you feature tracks that are arguably off the beaten path, really. Like you did Billy Joel's Pressure was a week ago or so. And Amazing. Like, honestly, that's one of my favorite Billy Joel tracks. And great. I um like so you came up with sort of the reasons why you pick certain tracks in, you know, features and having the headliner and whatnot, but how do you pick your tracks? Is it I mean, obviously you have a library, so you gotta pick from I have that. a massive library. And then honestly, you know, other than the Wednesday night show, I just it's what I feel like doing when I sit down. Like yesterday when it was Diana Ross, I, I woke up, I was looking through what I hadn't prepared yet. And I was like, oh, fuck it. I haven't done any Diana Ross. Like, so that's what's even more cool about doing Diana Ross. And, you know, 20 minutes in Jimmy Jam shows up and then Jimmy Jam goes and fucking texts or messages Nile Rogers and then Nile Rogers fucking shows up like like there's no plan there was no me reaching out to Jimmy and being like yo I'm doing fucking Diana that shit is entirely in the moment so yeah. my decision you know I don't I didn't get into life to have a boss right right so the idea of like you know people are like well can you schedule them so I know what's coming up I'm like no fucking turn on your fucking Instagram live at 11 o'clock and if you don't give a shit turn it off like right right why right. is this why is it why do I have to take the fun out of my experience by doing a fucking schedule fuck you it's not it's not a I'm not asking you to do anything other than check your phone at 11 o'clock right you know what I'm saying yeah for sure that's how I keep it alive for me because you know one of the problems with radio that really broke my heart was the playlist mm. was fucking walking in and having a computer fucking print out that told me what I was playing, how long I was playing it for, how long I could talk, you know, and, and the way that the clock works. So each hour the, the you know, there's without wanting to get too in the weeds about it. So each song has a category attached to it where it's like an A, a B, a C or a D and the D's are like the new stuff. And the problem for me was that the new stuff was always before the commercial break. So if you ran over on your previous hour, the song that you would not be allowed to play Is was the, the new, new shit. Ah. So I, would, I was having to fucking play completely fried <clears throat> and burnt fucking songs that I didn't give a shit about and try to sound excited. And the moment that I was excited about, which was to play a new piece of material, was robbed from me by the fucking advertising. So, you know, I just got to the point where I was like, you know, I don't want to have anyone dictate what I'm doing at all. And I was already kind of a little bummed with the live show where I knew that there were bands that I would play that people like I did. I did fucking Tool and oh. Slipknot, a magnificent fucking show. 120 people showed up and I was so fucking pissed off. And then I have to flip it because of my Asperger's. I have to flip it that that's 120 people that really wanted to experience it instead right. of me looking at it as the half empty thing of like, there's 80 fucking douchebags who didn't show up. So the th nice thing about the Instagram version is I don't give a fuck. If there's 10 people in the room. Awesome. If there's 400 people in the room, great. If there's 800 people in the room, great. I'm so sitting here doing this for myself. Yeah. 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 Well, I mean, that was my next question actually is like, how do you measure the show's success? uh how much of a great day i had cool no that's that's a brilliant way to to experience it or to to work period was my mind blown did i have an emotional connection did i learn something i didn't know prior you know like the one of the nice things about doing it is it's the first time that i've done the show with headphones on so i get to and unfortunately instagram doesn't broadcast in stereo so i'm actually experiencing a version of it that the listener isn't because i'm getting to hear these mixes build yeah. inside my headphones mm -hmm. and it's bl it routinely blows my fucking mind because it's an amazing way to hear the fucking song come together you know so to me a successful show is me fucking folding up the headphones and being like shit that was fucking amazing and if 10 people got to witness that, great. It doesn't, the amount of people no longer affects my enjoyment of the show, which is why this is, to be honest with you, this is my favorite version of the show that I've ever done. Well, it's interesting. I think as a business owner, I think we could all learn from that. Like just make the day about you and your level of fun with it. You know what I mean? Like <clears throat> I, was, I was struggling with that yesterday, as a matter of fact. You know, my, my dad had, 
my dad had a great deal of difficulty understanding what my life looked like. And he came out here for, um, I did uh, Soundgarden with Michael Beinhorn, who produced the, the album. And uh, was and Michael and I are, are good friends now. And it was a lovely, and I flew my dad out for it because he's a big Soundgarden fan. Oh, amazing. We were on our way to the airport. And he was like, I, you know, it was a really beautiful moment to have with your dad where he was like, I'm really sorry that I made it so hard on you because I didn't realize the whole time that you knew what you were doing. And I looked at him, I was like, I didn't. But what I did know was what I didn't want to do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right, right, right. That was the metric that I used was when I started to do something that didn't feel right, no matter how difficult a choice it was, I left it. Yeah. Because yeah. I knew, like, when I worked at the re at the record label, I was offered the fucking director of A&R position, and it's not flexing, it's just the truth. I was offered the, a the director of A&R position, which was going to make me one of the youngest A&R directors in the music industry. And the minute that they asked me, my panic <laughs> inside was like, yeah, no, I can't do that. And when I went wow. to my dad and told him I was leaving, he was fucking furious. And I left, and I ended up fucking managing a little fucking cool music venue run by a madman in peaks in in porchester new york and through that i met the kids that were throwing the t-shirts out and through that i became a kid who threw t-shirts out for the local radio station and through that i got to go on the air and you know i'm not a superhero it's just we all have that same ability there is a voice inside you that tells you when you're doing right or doing wrong no matter if that's a criminal enterprise or making a decision in a relationship or a decision in your life and it's so trite and it's such a fucking cliche but that voice is talking to you the whole time yeah like you have a gut for a reason I have a gut for a reason they, that's a reason they call it your gut instinct mm -hmm. you know what i'm saying like yeah. this isn't I'm not talking metaphysics that are beyond, you know, like sit under a tree for five years and meditate. It's like, nah, man, just listen to your gut brain. Right. And when your shit doesn't resonate, get the fuck away from it. I'd like to take a minute to thank you for listening to the Standard Age podcast. It's certainly been a lot of fun sharing each guest's story, even during the craziest of times over the last year. The good news is it's allowed me to further focus on some of the elements that make Standard Age possible. I've done a ton of product development, some items for well over a year. If you'd like to support the podcast, the least expensive way is to simply rate and review the show on whatever platform you're on. Further, you can visit standard-h.com where you can purchase the brand's apparel or directly support the podcast under the accessories tab. I can't thank you guys enough for listening to the show and for all of your support, especially through social media. It's been so much fun interacting with you and all of the great feedback has been wonderful, so thank you. So many of you are into watches, whether you are just starting to collect them or if you're already in deep in discussing the extensive finishing of the movements. In fact, my most listened to episodes have been watch related. For those of you interested in independent watch companies, Passion Fine Jewelry in Solana Beach, California might just have what you're looking for. Previous listeners may be familiar with owner Tim Jackson from episode one of the Standard Age podcast. He and his team are certainly a wealth of information while offering incredible customer service. Tim and his team are quite literally made up of family and friends, so I'm confident you'll feel very much a part of their community even if it's your first visit. Of course, if California is out of reach, definitely visit passionfinejewelry.com for more information. Or visit Tim's blog, Independent in Time, for a deeper watch dive. Now let's get back to the show. Well, I want to talk to you about your relationship with John Mayer real quick. So he was the, I guess, a recent drop-in in the DMs or whatnot, or the comment section. Is that how you guys came across one another? Well, you guys met years ago. I know. Yeah, but. we met. We met like when he first started. We actually talked about it. He was auditioning his first band when he first got signed, and we had my band was being showcased uh, at SIR, and we were down there, which is uh, an, uh, a studio instrument rentals. Uh, it's a place in Hollywood has you rent gear, but they also have beautiful sound stages and great PA, so all the bands showcase there. So we were doing a run of showcases and we were in the parking lot smoking cigarettes in between. And we were just hanging out with this young kid named John Mayer singing Bon Jovi songs and then basically watched him get in his van and like waved him off. And we're like, no, oh, we hope that kid does well. He's a real sweet, what a lovely little guy that guy was. Um, so the way that the relationship started, you know, is like, 
another app, you know, another, I think, 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 think they call aphorisms, but you know, an, you make your own luck. Right. So what happened was I've been doing it for a while and doing it for, it was July when he showed up. So it was probably, I've been doing it for like two months before that. And sorry, doing what? Doing the show on, on oh, the Instagram. Show. Right, right. So, and I have a couple friends of mine who are pretty accomplished musicians, but they're very much not in the public eye accomplished musicians. Like my right. friend Phil is a, you know, he was like studio musician type stuff. Yeah. I mean, my buddy Phil was Prince's horn arranger. Like I have people like that, you know, yeah. so there were a lot of those people were showing up and they were sort of letting their muso buddies know about it and being like, yo, you should check this shit out. So one day, a guy by the name of Charlie Hunter shows up and Charlie is a fucking brilliant guitar player. He has, he basically, his guitar is bass strings on the top and guitar strings on the bottom. And he plays in a way that is just fucking, it's bananas. Like you can check him out on Instagram. You can check out his records. And I knew his name. I wasn't particularly averse in his music because it's not really my vibe. But as minute I saw Charlie Hunter, I was like, oh shit, Charlie Hunter's here. So I always try to reach out to those folks to let them know that I'm grateful that they hang out because we all know that the hardest, most brutal judges in the world of anything are other musicians. Yeah. Because we start from a position of that sucks. Even if we've never heard it, if somebody <laughs> would be like, Hey, have you ever heard this band? You'd be like, yeah, no, they suck. You know, we're the worst judges in the world. So if you, <laughs> if you can win over like jaded asshole musicians to what you're doing, it means you're doing something kind of good. So I reached out to him and I was like, yeah, man, thank you so much for fucking hanging out. It means so much to see musicians. And he was like, dude, I'm spreading the word, you know, especially in COVID musicians are finding a hard time to be inspired. Everybody right, is, but right. specifically us or people like Charlie, who live gigging is their main income, mm -hmm. touring, playing with other musicians, writing with other musicians, you know, like now it's the Zoom writing session, which sucks. Because the yeah. way to write music is to be in the room and feel the energy. It's a it's brutal for for anybody creative right now. It's brutal for anyone, but creative people are specifically struggling because we our sh thing in quotes demands an audience. It demands a group experience. Yeah. So he was like, "Yo, man, it's really saving my fucking ass, and it's actually inspiring me." And blah 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 blah. So he started this great little chat in 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 the IG chat. And then one day I realized I wasn't following him. And I was like, oh, I got to fucking follow him. So I, <laughs> I, I, went to I went to follow him, which is like, you know, that's like the, 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 the post-millennial handshake. I'm like, ah, oh, I got to fucking, you know, it's like, yeah. so I went to follow him. Meanwhile, you're also saying like, oh shit, my bad. <laughs> yeah, like, my, dude, what a dick move. Sorry about that. <laughs> so I, I, I went to follow him. And then underneath, I noticed that he's followed by John Mayer. So I sent a message to him and I said, Hey man, how, you know, how close are you with mayor? And he was like, we're, you know, it's a mutual appreciation society. We're definitely professional friends, acquaintances outside of that. But, you know, we have a great relationship in that way. And I was like, well, if you, you know, ever feel inspired to, I would greatly appreciate you just letting him know what I'm doing. Because if there's anyone who I think would get what I'm doing, it's John oh, yeah. Mayer. Sure. And he was like, he's like, dude, I can't believe I didn't think of it already. Consider it done. And then I just let it go. And then I hit him up. A couple of weeks later, and I said, hey, man, thank because he'd continued to get more people coming in like Ben Spivak and like these really great uh, Carter Mack is a phenomenal yeah, drummer. Like drummer. all of yeah, these. I follow Carter. Of, Carter's great, man. So it's all of these like really cool. It's almost like the, the perfect way to do it because you want those cool tastemakers. Mm -hmm. You know, if it's fucking if it's just, you know, fucking Pharrell shows up, it's like, well, that guy will show up at the opening of a fucking envelope, you know, to have. <laughs> You know, these like, you know, to have these dudes who are cred and know what they're talking about, be like, this motherfucker's on some shit. It's mm -hmm. worth its weight in gold. So I reached out to him and I was like, dude, thanks so much, man. Is there anyone that I haven't done that you would love to hear as a thank you gift? And he was like, dude, Bob Marley. And I was like, fucking done. So, I, so we arranged it. I said, are you around next Tuesday morning? And he was like, fuck yeah, I'm in. So Tuesday I started to do, it was July 7th because I have the screen grab and July 7th, Suddenly fucking John Mayer showed up and was like, his first comment was like, this is inspirational. Thank you. And I messaged him and he sent me a really nice donation and I messaged him and we just started a conversation in DM about life and what's going on and sharing, <clears throat> you know, his fucking insane collection of very fucking high powered flashlights and all these crazy deep <laughs> dives that he goes down as like fucking watches and torches and yeah. <laughs> flashlights and now it's high-end gps units <laughs> seriously 
Well, he's Mr. Land Rover now, so. <laughs> oh, dude, he's a prepper. He's going to fucking Montana for these. He probably doesn't even want me to. Tell. He's he's going to another state for the fucking election. The the way that it, we got really connected was that I've been dealing with a, a major label on trying to get this thing legitimized because um, it's still not sanctioned by anybody. It's it's punk as fuck in that way. Um, so I was like, okay. I need help. So I reached out to him and I said, Hey man, I'm, I'm in negotiations with these people. Is there anyone that I can talk to on your end who you who could just guide me through what the fuck I should do? Right. And he was like, yeah, talk to this guy. And then it was his manager and his manager got on the phone with him, with me and was like, I would love to manage you. I've been watching all your live shit and I think it's amazing. And then he called me back and was like, and John wants to, wants to split that with you. So it went from this really cool Instagram relationship of just a mutual appreciation society to him legitimately wanting to help me grow this thing and make it, you know, cause he thinks it's important, which is really nice. I, yeah, I agree. You know, having someone like that and also his team and the people that he's involved with who are all at a very high level. And what's really uh, funny about it is that when I first started with my producers in LA talking about the TV show, we knew that we needed some sort of not necessarily celebrity, but establishment connection to allow us to open doors and be like, this guy's involved. And then they're being like, Oh, well, if that guy loves it. Right. So right. the first person we reached out to on Instagram messenger three years ago was John. And he ignored it, so which he should because he has nine trillion fucking messages. So yeah. we then reached out to Pharrell and I told him that. And he was like, man, that makes sense. He's like, Pharrell would be the next logical choice. You're absolutely <laughs> correct on that. So, you know, we had already thought of John three years ago because he really is the perfect dude. He right. shares, you know, my comedic sensibilities. He shares a, a nerdiness about gear, but he's also a brilliant, brilliant musician. Yeah. Uh, and he's the perfect proselytizer and he's the perfect you know support and he's a really lovely guy like i genuinely you know we've met a couple of times and and we get along in a in a very specific way and it's it's really nice and he's really proud of what i'm doing and that is a that's a a really cool unique relationship to have with somebody who you haven't actually met until two months ago and we've been friends on instagram messenger for like four months you know and then we sort of met and it was like this is the most this is the most like ridiculous bumble date. Right. I was going to say it's like a bumble date. <laughs> it was horrible. So, I, you know, that was the thing is like to me, that's a way to really be able to check and make sure that you're you know, once again, like the gut followed by the universe in quotes, who I refer to as the great pumpkin as the great pumpkin also steering you. And if you pay attention to those things, like, you know, it's, I think it was Jack Nicklaus. Was, I don't know if it was Jack Nicklaus, but somebody, the, whoever said you make your own luck. I mean, I think Jack Nicklaus is like, luck is when preparation meets experience. I think that was his quote. But I believe in all of that stuff. You know, I do right, believe. Right. And, it's, and it's not available only to wizards. Right, right. That's why the, that's why the self-help department of a bookstore is so enormous. Like, all right, of this right. information is available. You don't need yeah. the secret. You just need to fucking have faith in yourself. And then when you lose that faith, you look at the things around you and you're like, man, what is, that? okay, I guess, you know, I'm fucking, I've met this amazing chick. On Tuesday, we're fucking like, this is like, you know, people who fall in love and know that they met their soulmate the first time they've met them. Right, right. Yeah, yeah. Have you dissected, I call it dissection. I don't know if you consider it that. Have you broken down? Have you broken down a John Mayer track then? I haven't, but the other day was his birthday, right? And uh, I did a Stevie Ray Vaughan song. But to start with, I was like, okay, we're doing this song today, and I and then I, I pressed play on Bodies of Wonderland. I was there for that. It was hilarious. He was like, "Let's go," and I was like, "Would you really do Bodies of Wonderland with me?" And he was like, "Fuck yeah!" So and everybody wanted you to. I know, I know. So uh, if I'm gonna do that, because it's hard. There's a 20 second time lag in the fucking chat which makes it hard to talk to people so he and i if we're going to do that we're going to do it in person together in the room uh right, at, right. at the podcast studio which i'm hopefully going to do with a couple of other people as well because i didn't have a space that i could utilize that's why i did a test run with my buddy matt uh the host of the smoking tire uh we did pearl jam songs last friday and it worked it worked worked perfectly so i now know that i can do guests down there we both get tested we're fucking cool we can sit in the room together blah 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 
Yeah, I was going to ask actually later, how, how did you come across Matt or how do you guys know each other? Matt Farah. Yeah, Matt Farah. What a lovely chap. So his wife is, and she will always, she's every time she'll look at the two of us and be like, this friendship is because I was a fan first. Uh, so his wife ah. um, was a huge fan and she turned him onto it. And uh, he came to a couple of live ones. And then I did, uh, I broke down the song that Hannah walks down the aisle to at his, at their wedding. The night before we surprised her, I flew to New York and we did a session at their free reception party where we surprised her with the gift of a queen, somebody to love session. And then the next day she walked down the aisle to it. And that sort of like sealed our friendship in concrete at that point. And, oh, that's uh, incredible. you know, and then since then we're, you know, Sunday drive buddies and I get to go on his podcast and he's generous and uh, they're both such fucking great people. And, you know, it's when you, when you find people like that and you instantly resonate with them, you know, it's a, it's a really cool experience. Yeah. And he's also, you know, like it, it's one of those things where, and we talk about this, you know, with like Camisa and, you know, that was why uh, Carl and um, Alex Roy, you know, he calls us his, um, he calls us his philosopher Kings because it's really nice when you get to hang out with people that might not do the same thing that you do and have the same level of passion for it, but they have the same level of knowledge and passion in their own world. Right. right. Like going on a drive with Matt where you're doing like 120 miles an hour through the fucking, you know, the, the Malibu canyons in a McLaren and you're completely safe. Cause you know, this fucking dude knows exactly what he's doing. You know, like his knowledge of cars, they are such train spotters. Like, well, that's clearly a 76 BMW 2002 because the kidney shaped grills and the fucking flash, the, the indicator buttons are for, the, and you're like, it's a Euro spec. And I'm like, holy shit, this is, but meanwhile, I can tell you the drama that played on the fucking, you know, obscure Japanese import of a police record when the other guy broke his arm. So it's like different levels of the same level of neurotic encyclopedic knowledge and passion and it's right. it's awesome when you get to hang out with people like that because it's incredible. you start at the same level but you also learn so much from each other yeah for sure i'd, I'd love to get matt on this show frankly because i want to you know this is more about the background and the people right like it's not right and it's also to obviously promote things like the sessions or you know smoke and tire for that you know right um one of these well, I will talk to him about it. I'm sure. I'm sure he'll do it because yeah. his story is also a really great story. You know, I mean, and we could record at his place. I don't care. Um, you and I met through Jensen Reed. Um, you guys together created the theme track for this podcast. It's called "After the War." Is the the instrumental that I actually use for this this podcast. I um, that came up on my iPod the other day while I was driving around, and I texted them afterwards because I was like, "This is." We did some really cool shit together, for sure. So tell me about your relationship with Jensen and how that's kind of morphed, evolved, what have you. Uh, he was, I, I was playing drums in a band that had, was started during the writer's strike, uh, a mashup band, which was really, I think it was, yeah, it, was, it must have been. So he was the opening, opening act for that. And it was just him and a DJ. And I went up to him afterwards and I was like, hey, man, do you have any recordings? And he was like, yeah, because I was like, I really like what you're doing. And then he sent them to me. And then, you know, like one of the one of the problems with Asperger's, which is a solution and a problem into itself, is my version of it specifically. And you'll see this in uh, other people who have it. If you watch television programs about us is we, we're brutally honest. We don't actually have time for the bullshit because the bullshit is just bullshit. So I hit him up and I was like, yo, these recordings are terrible. I'm like, this is like nothing like what you're, what you're doing. And he was like, yeah, I kind of feel the same way. And I'm like, well, just, you know, I was making records, but the really nice thing about me making records was that I had a job that paid me enough to survive and I have a little bit of change at the end of the day. So if I did records, I didn't have to do records to make money. Right. So I could opt to just make records with people and, you know, with him, I was like, let's do the first one. Like, I'm a crack dealer. Do the first one for free. And if it's great, you can work out what you want to do. And you'll have a, a free song. 
And if it's garbage, no harm, no foul. Like you're not going to resent me because you paid 500 bucks or blah, blah, blah. So we worked together and immediately he was like, holy shit, this is what I've always wanted to sound like. Because I do, because of my, you know, my encyclopedic Asperger's brain is full of a lot of things. And I, I do have... I think I have an ability when it comes to make records and this is really pretentious, but I do, I believe it is that I think I have the ability to find the, the person inside their own music. Mm. And I think that that's a really important trait for a music producer. And uh, with Jensen, you know, we did three records together. I directed a bunch of those music videos and got to sing on a couple things like after the war and uh it was a you know it was a really rich fertile environment you know the problem is is that a career in the music industry as i have you know witnessed and experienced is like you have to be willing to go it alone it's kind of interesting that you mentioned your encyclopedic knowledge because i literally had that written down that you have this encyclopedic knowledge of of what you do and I was going to ask you, actually, is there any other subject in your life where you feel like that's on display? You just walk into my apartment and you know that the, all this guy cares about is music. Like, I don't give a fuck about anything else. Right. I mean, I live in a studio apartment on my own because I don't, at, you know, have had to look at myself and say, how important is a relationship? Right. How important is being in love with someone? How important is being married? How important are those things? And... I had to look at them and, and say not as important as, and not mm. as important as in, and not, not as a, what a fucking a terrible sentence, not, not as important as I didn't want it. But what was more important wasn't success. What was more important was I don't believe that I would, I could be an effective partner for somebody until I found out what it is that I'm going to do. Mm -hmm. because I was bumbling from, you know, I wore, I literally went and did every single job in the music industry that I thought was going to bring me joy. And none of it did because at the end of the day, none of it was about music. Right. Radio wasn't about music. Working at a record label wasn't about music. Working on music videos wasn't about music. Being a music supervisor in movies wasn't about music. Producing wasn't about music. You know, it was, you know, I'm a brutal producer. Like I tell every band I work with, your opinion doesn't matter. I will hear your suggestions, mm -hmm. but if I don't think that that serves the material, none of that shit matters. Mine is the only voice that matters in this room. And the reason that you're sitting here is because you've heard music that I've done that you think is amazing. The same filter was applied to that. Right, right. So don't think that you're fucking special. And there are bands that have been special. I did a band called Analog Saint where I changed nothing. And that was why I loved working with that band was they were so fully formed already. But, you know, the, 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 the idea of like having to make these really, really difficult choices because I knew that I would be a useless partner to somebody until I knew how I was going to work inside the madness that is the world. And it took these crazy, weird turns and opportunities for me to find myself here. And one of the things that I'm really interested in is who I'm going to be now in a relationship with somebody, because I do have this knowledge of like, wow, this is what I do. <laughs> I do this now. Like, this is my job. I do something that, and it's not a flex. It's just the truth. I do something that nobody else on the planet does. There's nobody else who does what I do. You can't walk into a room anywhere else on the planet and find 200 people staring at a Pro Tools screen while a guy takes a fucking Beatles songs down to the rafters in front of you. What makes you feel valuable? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, one of the really sad things about Asperger's is that it doesn't it doesn't allow the person like it's such a solitary experience that it doesn't allow the person who has it in general to feel that they are held in the mind of people they are not in front of 
So I have no understanding that my friends ever think of me. I have no understanding mm. that my parents or my sister, anybody else ever walks down the street and sees something and it was like, wow, Christian, or just is like, wow, what are Christians doing right now? So it's a really solitary experience. So the, you know, my, my fear with the live show was like, I was starting to become concerned that the validation from the crowd was really important. And I, I realize now through doing the Instagram version that it isn't the validation from the crowd. It's just simply being able to have people experience what I want them to experience. Being able to have, to share a moment of like, this is a moment where we can be poignant. This is a moment where we can be sad. This is a moment where we can be happy because that to me is connection that I don't have in other aspects of my life. So I Sweet. feel my value in that way because I know that that's, and I hate to talk about it in these terms, but I, I know that that is at the core of it. That's the art that I do. Mm. And I, I hate talking in these fucking big blown out jerk off ways, but it's, it is true. <laughs> like it's, it, it's taken me a long time to have to be able to look at myself and be like, dude, you're an artist. Like, this is what you do. Like you create art for a living. And you're really lucky in that way. And once you can frame that experience, it does give you permission to look at what you do and to be able to see it as different than the other things that other artists offer. Like, I'm not that person. I'm not that person. You know, like Rick Beato does, has the same information that I have and does his version of it on YouTube. And it's a version I could never in a million years do because I have none of that dude's knowledge. And his art is that version of it. But that motherfucker could not sit in front of 200 people. And you know, that's the other thing that, that if you've never been to my show, like it's all improv. I walk, I sit down with nothing other than an index card of facts. And then I make up a show for two hours. And it is the most unbelievable high that I've ever experienced. So that's your prep. You just, what, a Wikipedia or something to figure out who did Wikipedia, what? Wikipedia, books that I have, you know, information that I've glommed from the millions of music magazines I've read yeah, in my life. Totally. You know, my own personal experiences of sometimes those people or experiences that were similar. You know, it was like a really great compliment that a fan paid me, which was really, really, <laughs> it was like one of those that brought me to tears was like, it was like, I don't think you understand that one of the reasons that we keep coming back is that we know that you've been in the room for every single one of the experiences that you're telling us about. Right. And that's right. completely true. I've sat in a room and had a song downloaded to me, like after the war just flowed out of the two of us. There was no conversation. My performance at the end of it just came out of me. The whole thing just so I've been there and I've watched that happen to friends of mine. I've been in the room when it's happened in recording studios, in rehearsal rooms, in live situations. You know, like when I was with PM Dawn, I got to stand on stage. He, Prince B, he would, one day Prince saw me like jumping up and down, like losing my shit in the, in the wings. And he comes up to me after the show and he was like, dude, come out on stage and do that. He's like, you are so fucking stoked. It really chokes me up, man. My, that, what a beautiful person. And he was like, it's, see you fucking stoked at our music. He's like, come on out and do that. So I got to come out and just jump up and down and get the crowd to go crazy. And when we finished the Peter Gabriel tour, there were 200,000 people in Golden Gate Park. And I got to stand on stage and watch 200,000 people lose their fucking minds. And I wasn't a performer. I was just a dude jumping up and down, sharing right. the joy <laughs> of the music with one of my, you know, a really close friend. And that's a profound experience. So sure. I don't have Tom Morello's experience, which is even more gnarly to stand on stage in front of 200,000 people. But I can, I can experience, I can understand what he's trying to tell people if you were telling that story. And I really think that that is the ability to tell story. Obviously, I like to talk and I love to communicate. And the ability to do that is that's the killer app that I have in right. what I do that others don't. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah. You know, like that, that to me is the, is why this thing feels so right. I mean, a friend of mine was in the chat for the 
Prince one. She was a huge Prince fan. I told her I was doing it and she's my ex-girlfriend. So she's known me in a way that most others don't. And she was like, she just chatted and was like, holy shit, dude, this is everything you've ever wanted to do. You just get to talk about music, play music, and you don't have to deal with anybody. And I was like, I know. Oh man, that's amazing. What prompted the red floor in your apartment? Well, in the orange walls, I guess. Is it orange and red? Yeah, it's orange. So it's orange, but then it does this cool thing where like the orange comes down and then it divides and then it, it, here. Right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's only this wall and then it goes to this wall over here. I haven't made my bed yet. Um, so those who watch the session, you'll see Christian sitting on the floor, cross-legged. Yeah. And it's, it's so dope. It's, it's orange and red. And you're like, what kind of den <laughs> <laughs> is this? Yeah. Uh, one of the guys, uh, Frank from the radio show, described it because they saw it with, uh, when I did my first Zoom call with them, and he was like, "It looks like a McDonald's sex dungeon." And I was like, "That's so fucking." I was like, "That's so fucking good," because I have the purple things. These are like grimace. Oh colors, yeah, grimace. Like these, yeah. These, yeah, it's fucking amazing. I was like, "That's so fucking good." Um, well, you know, one of the things that my mom was, uh, as I said, is like an interior designer bathrooms and kitchens and you know our houses were always unbelievably beautiful and we knew we were moving when my mom did a room for the second time like Mm -hmm. that was when we were like oh this fucking bitch needs a new canvas box it all up people we're moving on you know what i'm saying like when the laundry room is being finished the clock is fucking ticking you know i was like oh man we got like maybe my sister and i look at each other be like maybe we got three months left dude don't get attached to anybody we're out of here so when i moved into my place uh you know like i've always been my you know because of my mom's indoctrination i'm all a a room a a building is a canvas and when i moved into here and then i knew that i was going to be staying here for a while i was like i can't have carpet and all that fucking shit it's gross it's it lays an asperger's nature to it and you know i'm you know i'm a little bit bold in most of the choices that i make in my life and i was like fuck it i'm gonna have a red fucking floor because a red floor is fucking sick so i got driveway paint and painted it red and then what i did with the walls you can't really tell if you don't look at them but one of the problems with asperger's is that you don't really have an understanding of gray it's a binary thing it's yes or no i either hate things or i like things people foods whatever so I was like, okay, I need to learn gray. So each of the walls is actually a different gray. And some of them are matte and some of them are uh, shiny. And what I, the orange was, I decided that every time I felt like I'd made a leap of my understanding of things, I would reward myself with orange. Interesting. So the orange wall and the orange floor is a reward. I got rid of gray. I got rid of one gray aspect and painted it orange as a reward for having got rid of one more which is a completely aspergian response but but how did you settle on orange specifically because i love orange i think orange i mean Favorite i have like color. an orange band fucking tattoo that was seven hours of the most brutal pain got horribly infected because oh. i wanted part of my skin to be completely orange because orange to me is like there's something about orange which is both hot and cold there's something about orange that is both comforting and startling and there's no other color that does that for you every other color makes a demand of you like red makes a demand of you blue makes a demand of you green makes a demand of you orange doesn't really demand anything of you you just kind of have to you have to bring a lot to orange and work out what your version of orange is that day it's like oh orange is totally fucking hot or like no man orange is like comforting and like a sweet fruit that i eat you know what I'm saying? So orange like lives in a world that doesn't, it's like, it, it might be like maybe orange is, maybe I'm orange. Like it's that sort of thing where the, you, you know, the version of me you experience depends on what version of me you wanted to experience that day. But that's how I feel about orange. It's a beautiful, it's a beautiful color that does so much for you by asking nothing of you whatsoever. Oh man, that's brilliant. Well, I want to be sensitive to your time because uh, I know you got to eat and record is there such thing as a perfect album? Yeah. And if, if so, what is it? Or what are they? Um, there are a few of them. You know, wh- one of the things when I first started the COVID thing and I didn't have this little cable that changed my life, I actually spent 
week, it's like two weeks, I think, walking everybody through my CD collection. Um, the, the Perfect Beatles album, you know, Revolver is my Perfect Beatles album. Uh, my favorite, you know, I, I've never been able to make a favorite song list that gives me a fucking panic attack. <laughs> but I do have, I do have a favorite album and my favorite album is a record made by a band called The Blue Nile in like 1984. Mm. Uh, which is this Scottish band and it's called a walk across the rooftops and it's unlike anything that's ever been made before or since the the tendrils and effect of that record reach so far into the universe and I've been a fan of it my entire life and I've recently through really strange circumstances been allowed to have uh, an email friendship between myself and the lead singer uh, who lives in Scotland. He's like this fucking 60 plus year old man at this point, And he's just a tr the real deal. That record is perfect. Frightened Rabbits, Midnight Organ Fight is a perfect record. Uh, Angels and Airwaves second album is a perfect record. Mm, interesting. Tubular Bells is a perfect record. Amnesiac is a perfect record. Mm. Um, Jimmy World's Clarity is a perfect record. Um, I like it. It's not, it's, yeah, you're, you're in a couple different cookie jars. The there. Vulgar display of power is a perfect record. Um, there's a few of them. Uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not so well versed in like the traditional classic rumors is obviously a perfect, a perfect record. Uh, that's why rumors is rumors. Um, so there's, you know, there are definitely perfect third eye blinds. Second record is a perfect record. Uh, and a perfect record to me is also, isn't simply that the songs are great. It's that the, the the sound of it is the sound of the album. I think it's hard to have a perfect album if it's not recorded perfectly and framed perfectly. So that makes right. it an even greater rarity when you bump into a perfect record. Sure. Uh, you know, Pet Sounds is a perfect record. You know, there are, there are some of them where you're just like, oh yeah, that's like the Mount Rushmore of perfect records. Um, but yeah, some of the other ones that are, you know, indie records that people might not know about or other things. The Cure's Kiss Me, Kiss Me, Kiss Me is a perfect record. Depeche Mode's Violator is a perfect record. Um, so there's, you know, there are definitely enough of them. I just couldn't rank them in importance beyond the Blue Nile being the first one. Well, I could talk to you for three hours, but I, again, I want to be sensitive to your time. Um, you got to eat and you record in 20 minutes. I do. Um, please promote whatever you want right now. Cause I could talk to you for three more hours. <laughs> I had a bunch of questions we didn't even get to bro. Like, um, honestly, the, uh, what's the one question in the bunch left that you would want an answer? Oh, I, I, I honestly don't know. Like, I mean, I've got like, what was your first car? Cause I know you're somewhat of a car guy. You know what I mean? First car was, this is great. So my buddy in, uh, Brent Bodie, when I was in high school had, a series of two or three of those little Honda Accords, the hatchbacks, like yeah. the little two, yeah. the little the two Civic door hatchback. It wasn't a Civic; it was called an Accord, but it was before the Civic. Okay. So this is before your in born, the eighties. No, in no. the eighties, <laughs> and they were they were silver, and they were two door, and they were fucking awesome. And he beat the shit out of these things, and they would drive for six hundred thousand miles. And so my dad was like, "I'm going to buy you your first car." So I was like, great. He's like, what do you want? I'm like, I want a two-door Honda fucking Accord. He was like, okay. And we looked at them. They were right in the price range. And then because my dad's my dad, he decided, because in England, they're much better quality and they had just been brought over here. He decided to buy me for $2,000 more than the budget that he'd offered me initially, a fucking Renault Encore, which was the, a brown piece of shit Renault Encore that was so bad that when I was driving to New York for the first time, I owned it for two days. I'd done my driving test in it. I was driving on I-95 and I went to put it into fifth gear and it wouldn't go into fifth. Fifth never worked for the two years that I owned it. It was <laughs> oh, such a no. piece of shit that eventually I drove it back to Maryland. I threw the keys at him and I said, you get rid of it. It's your fucking problem now. And then- <laughs> And meanwhile, you're getting shitty gas mileage. <laughs> the worst gas mileage. There was nothing fucking cool about it. It was a horrendous piece of shit. The stereo was garbage. So with my own money, the first car I purchased was a 1987 Honda Civic CRX SI which had the fucking the, the round cheese cutter wheels like with the fucking dope rims on it and that thing had 129,000 miles on it when i bought it i pushed it through to 200,000 miles and with 200,000 miles on it driving from dc 
to New York, which is the equivalent of, you know, San Fran to LA, I was right. getting 70 miles to the gallon. <laughs> Let me pick my jaw up off the floor. 70 miles to the gallon on a car with 200,000 miles on it. That's how well, and that car got better gas mileage the older that engine got. So that was my first car that I purchased for myself. And oh, I put man. a sick fucking system in it because it had no back seats. So it was right. like, you're already like, there was, all so there was, nothing, there was yeah. nothing to sacrifice. You know what I'm saying? It wasn't, and I got like a, the biggest kicker box I could. I had an amazing fucking blau punked head unit. I had amps. It was a cool little, like, if you turned around, there was like a little jacket fucking holder thing. I just filled that with amplifiers and a fan. <laughs> and that fucking car was outrageous, dude. I love that car. But yeah, my oh, first man. was a piece of shit on fucking Renault Encore that my dad bought that eventually I just gave back to him and said, you get rid of it. It's your problem now. <laughs> That's amazing. That's brilliant. <laughs> Christian, thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you, man. man. Good to see you again. Good um, to see you. I might, on the outro, I think I might play the vocal version of the theme track because I just use the instrumental. So, Oh, nice. For those of you listening, enjoy the, the, the real deal. <laughs> and uh, if you want to find me, it's at King Trot on Instagram. The session on air is the Instagram that only has the live feeds on it. I had to do two because I didn't want to get my legit one taken down from right. copyright infractions. Yeah. And then any questions that you have, just go to the session on air uh, website. There's an archive of all of the KLOS shows under radio shows. So there's like four years of 20 minute segments there. Uh, I just did Sister Christian on Monday, which is amazing. And then uh, Elvis, Suspicious Minds two weeks ago, which is just like... <laughs> Yeah, yeah mind blowing so that's a great way to get the archive and then just see me at 11 o'clock pacific time every monday through friday and then wednesday nights at seven and then sporadically during the week i'll just show up because i feel like doing something because i'm bored that's thank awesome, you so man. much for having me man what yeah a, of a course conversation man. this was super fun i really appreciate it anytime, anytime. all right man. and i'll talk to matt for you oh yeah D thank you that'd be rad at least i can do okay buddy be safe. thank you yeah likewise cheers Bye. Huge thanks goes to Christian for taking the time. Shout out always to Jensen Reed and to Clear Audio for the noise cancellation headphones. Now please enjoy the full edit of what is typically only the instrumental of the song After the War. Happy holidays, everybody, and cheers to 2021.